Well, hello everyone, and welcome back. It is that time again. It is Readings with Rebecca. And after that brief and very stern look for me where I was still figuring out exactly what the hell I was doing, because really, who knows? Here we are. I am, of course, your co your host, Rebecca Snowhair, pen name Rebecca Mickley. It's nice to see you guys. Nice to be back. Although I still am a little sad that I am not on the trail. Okay, no, not a little sad. Big sad, but life goes on. There's always next year. All of that fun stuff. So I see that my IT department is still here, is watching this stream. They're right here, Ray. They're looking at me. Uh, I'm wondering if I could get my IT department to come in and help me with some on site technical support. You see, I'm almost out of sparkling water. And I think he is the only one that can help me without sliding off screen. So this is a real issue because I've got to read for the next hour. Hint, hint, hint. Yep, I'm dry. Oh, oh, we might just get like a quick view. Oh, we saw a hand. And... He's out again. You know, it's so wonderful when they're well trained. That's all I gotta say to that. Ten years I've been working on that one. Water break number two. <clears throat> In all seriousness, folks, a deep thank you to my IT department. Yes. <clears throat> Forsooth! What light through yonder window breaks? It is Finley. Did you trip? Well, it is actually really great to be back here. Uh, I miss you guys. You guys are the raddest, as they say. Let me just rearrange everything here. I like to look over here when I see my, uh, like you actually know what I'm gesturing to. I have multiple monitors. My monitor over here uh, lets me have a better vantage point because I am right-handed, right pod. Uh, and now I can see my chat easier, so I'm not always looking over here. It's like the real me. The profile me. Front. Side. But. Yeah, that's all of us this. these last few weeks. And the grim, dark reality that is April 2020, there was only social distancing and isolation. Gotta. throw out a nod there to Warhammer. Yeah, and that's normally when I retcon like heck and revise. Um, I just changed the name of a drive system that's going to show up in one of my novels at some point in the near future. And uh, because I found a better term for it. But, I mean, they say that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results but then riders were never the most stable <laughs> folks in the world anyway because you end up going over the same narrative over and over again making small changes until the whole thing is bespoke and it evolves over time it's completely natural uh what you're going through there nega um, because it's often in going forward that we get a clearer picture of where we've been. That's not just true of writing, but 
also real life. You know, we are ever growing in understanding, as uh, Darnak might say. So yeah, don't be afraid. Write it out, even if it's not perfect. Um, there is no such thing as perfect, even amongst the gods. And uh, also, don't be afraid to rewrite. Uh, you know, it, it's a very common uh, phrase that if you want to be a writer, you have to get uh, comfortable with killing your darlings. <laughs> I take that a little literally, uh, but, you know, writing is ultimately an exercise in being humble, not just around others, but also with yourself. It's accepting the fact that what you think is the biggest, greatest, most amazing thing one day will not be so the next. And it's having the courage to face that and being willing to change that. So yeah, don't let the fears of where you are keep you from going to where you need to be. Yay! We're like seven minutes in and you've already got a ramp from Rebecca. I mean, we're just on point. But I would be remiss uh, if I uh, did not mention the elephant in the room well not elephant the nigga mewtwo in the room because as of april the first nigga mewtwo has successfully completed another trip around the sun he is an april first kiddo i do not know exactly how old you are now i am not going to ask because that is rude uh but at any length, if I could talk, a very happy birthday to you, Nega Mewtwo, uh, from all of us here at Studio Prey. Uh, I wish you many, many more uh, successful and happy years. Uh, may you be continually surprised uh, by how good your life can be. Um, 22. <laughs> yeah, I'm... I'm 39, uh, almost 40. I'll be 40 in next January. And I don't feel it. I mean, my knees do sometimes. My back does sometimes. But uh, by and large, I really... I don't know what feeling your age really means. You know? Because I never expected to live past 28. And I mean, I mean that quite seriously. I figured that by 28 my life would be done and then I hit 28 and of course I kept going and that was one heck of a shock uh, my, my whole life I just perceived the age of 28 as my expiration date I couldn't imagine living that long I couldn't imagine living much further than that and then it came and went and that was a big moment for me because I realized that my life had no expiration date I had no idea how long I was going to be here and that's when I really started to make decisions about how I needed to start living my life for me you know I needed to make my life what I wanted it to be I needed to be free to pursue those things. Now, I'd always been told, you know, pursue your dreams, live your life, you know, by, you know, the, the guidance counselors and, the, you know, your parents and, and, and things like that. But up until 28, I was largely living for other people because I just didn't expect that it would matter. <laughs> and now here we are. You know, now here we are. Uh, 11 years past uh, what I perceived as my original expiration date. So, you know, may you all be continually surprised. It's it's pretty amazing where life can take you. I uh, always wanted to be a writer, an author, a novelist, a blogger. Uh, well, not blogger, I mean, you know, but, I mean, blogging actually 
evolved over the course of my lifetime because I'm old. Um, but uh, and and, and I I I always wanted to be like an adventurer slash explorer. Never thought I'd do it. Here I am, <laughs> you know. So uh, yeah, guys. Uh, never let 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 yourself be stopped by what you think might be. And uh, never accept that your current uh, setbacks and limitations will be forever because life is quantum, life is strange, life is spooky, uh, and uh, life is absolutely untamed and wild if you let it be. But anyway, now we've got two rants in 12 minutes call somebody called guinness holy crap um aside from our birthday mewtwo uh let's see here happy birthday to her uh we've got finley we've got damon herrera we've got my it department hello it department and once again thank you I know. Someone should just say stuff it, Bunny, already in, in the spirit of the the work that uh, we are reading. I realized that I messed up on the announcement this time. Um, instead of, uh, we aren't starting at Chapter 2. We've covered Chapter 2. At least I remember us covering chapter two i have slept some since then uh so we'll be starting with chapter three today scandal shock fear panic terror the choice to run came quickly or maybe not to quote hunter s thompson in fear and loathing on the campaign trail 1973 great read great movie with johnny depp hilarious so, here we are. You know, of all the things that I was going to miss on the trail, this is one of the things that I uh, thought I was going to miss most, and now here we are back again. You guys doing okay out there with all the social distancing? All that fun stuff? I... I remember my live stream, I was, you know, uh, like, you want to talk about how fast things can change, you know, I really minimize COVID, I hope, you know, and for most people, thank the gods, it is mostly the cult from hell, but it's not going to be that way for everyone. And so, as hard as this stuff is, we, we've got to hunker down and kind of bite the bullet. You know, cliche city. And see it through, but it's not fun. I can't really hike right now. I was going to go to the Capital State Forest and do just a small 13 miler. Park shut down the next day. Uh, they're telling you go outside for fresh air and exercise, but not like that, basically, is what we keep hearing. And, uh... Hey! Bones and hot sauce! Hey, Maya! It's great to see you, buddy. Did you hear, Maya, that Nega Mewtwo had a birthday this week? April 1st, she completed another revolution around the sun. <clears throat> Maya, you're a college student. PJs are 98% of your wardrobe. You know, people complain about the economy and they worry about the economy and I understand why they worry about the economy Mr. Amos 7178 but at the end money isn't real <laughs> I mean 
we make our lives a living hell over this thing that's not real, but... You know, a fiat currency is all about the faith and credit of the one that is earning it, and the people that have faith and credit in the ones that's earning it. So, it means precisely as much as we all want it to mean. Uh, and to maybe put it more accurately, it means as much as the powers that be want it to mean. And so, I expect it to get harder. I expect things to get tougher, but we will get through it all together. But in the end, somebody will come up with a law or an explanation or just some casual BS and a one will flip to a zero and everything will suddenly start to recover. And... Uh, yeah, starting tomorrow, I'm doing two-a-days. I'm doing my hour, like, seven-mile run in the morning and on the treadmill, and then I'm doing, like, a, a little three-mile slow jog in the evening just to keep active, you know, um, the the morning sessions. I mean, it's kicking my butt, I think, because of all the stress, but it's still just not enough for me, you know. I was planning on doing 15 to 20 miles a day on the PCT, so, you know, getting two runs in should at least help me with the stress and the terror. Um, also, the fact that I'm getting out, you know, uh, it's funny, I spent so many years as a recluse, uh, but, you know, I mean, I can do it. It's really no problem. I, I really get miserable. I really get inside my own head, which is both good and bad for my writing. But uh, now that I've gotten out of that, it's it's really scary to be on the precipice of kind of being dragged back into it because it takes a lot of work for me to find the courage to step outside. Um, anxiety... Uh, both social and generalized is very real with me. I am a germaphobe, which makes all of this just wonderful. Um, I've washed my hands so much that I uh, that they're cracked and bleeding, but we're coping, you know. And so, you know, getting out I think will be very healthy for me. Keep me in that habit. Don't worry about me, guys. Everything is fine. It really is. I'm building a new computer this week. Uh, you know, I'm staying healthy. I'm staying active. And I'm hanging out with you. All right. So, where we last left off in Exiles Return, the eponymous first novel. From the elusive, mysterious, and strange Rebecca Mickley, uh, Snow was pulled off her planet, pulled out of feralism, <laughs> uh, is kind of reorienting uh, to being in any kind of society, having any kind of conversation, and... Uh, this will be... I always build my computers, uh, nigga. Uh, I just... I don't like, you know, the off-the-shelf stuff. I like customizing my hardware. I'm also um, a Linux user. Uh, I use Windows 10, or will be, unfortunately, using Windows 10 um, for... Uh, stuff that, you know, I have to, but it's going to be a secondary operating system on a drive that I, that will actually be removed when Windows 10 is not in use because, uh, well, if you guys want to hear my Microsoft rant, let me know because it's freaking epic, but it will be the third rant of the day. Uh... But that's all completely up to you. We still got some reading to do. But uh, anyway, Snow's been pulled off. She's 
back in uh, in human society uh, quite reluctantly and if you'll notice there's a large difference uh, between snow from Dawnbreak to Exiles Return so far and some of that is because Exiles Return was written first and I, I'm a better writer and uh, uh, then and now than I was, you know, at the start. I, I've often said, you know, if you're lucky, the first book you publish will be the worst thing you've ever written, because that means you've just gotten better after each one, right? Um, that being said, I'm very proud of Exile. Um. All right. Well, it sounds like we have an accord. I, uh, Damon Nega, let me know. Do you want to hear about Microsoft Rant before we get into this? Uh. Because I, I'm more than willing. You know, I, I'm right here. I am primed and raring to go. I've already had two rants. What about third breakfast? Um, you know, that is a scary thought. You know, hobbits eat a lot in the J.R.R. Tolkien novel. You know, they have first breakfast, second breakfast, eleven Z's, all of that. So... Do the hobbits have a word for gluttony? And if they do, what would a gluttonous hobbit look like? I mean, are we talking like smog on methamphetamine when it comes to food, or or what? Because it's like you know, if hobbits have like eight meals a day, what does overeating look like for a hobbit? And God's help us, you know. <laughs> But Microsoft, oh god, um, Microsoft is evil, uh, uh, patently, objectively, undeniably, irrexibly, insert synonym here, freaking evil, uh, I don't really think they necessarily started out that way, but they are a predatory monopoly corporation that is so dedicated to preserving its market share that they will go above and beyond the pale to screw over their customers largely because there is not outside of Apple a bespoke option or a off-the-shelf option that has the wide breadth level of appeal and user-friendly accessibility that Microsoft has. Uh, they are absolute enemies of the idea that you own the software that you buy. They are champions of the software of service model, which is probably one of the greatest abominations uh, that's ever come across in terms of technological market theory. Um, the idea that you rent code and that you have no choice but to continue to pay for it every month it's one of the biggest monetary scams that I've ever heard of and the entire software industry seems to be on top of it like white on rice and a glass of milk in the snowstorm because it's a way that they can bilk the people that they rely on for their survival uh, for more dollars for no real perceived benefit either. And on top of that all, Microsoft is data mining. They have very little respect for privacy. They have very little respect for the fact that you own your hardware and that they do not have a right to sit like an FBI van over a mafia-owned restaurant pulling whatever data that they can out of you so they can resell it to third parties, credit reports, or whatever else will make them a buck because the money they're already siphoning out of you for Office 365 and every other piece of poorly designed crap that you have no other choice but to use because they have put more money into bilking their customers and creating a software model that bilks their customers and actual producing a quality coded program that does what it's advertised to do it's just a frickin mess 
But what choice do we have, right? It's Windows 10 or nothing now. I have seen train wrecks that are better designed from the level up than Windows 10. I mean, they have literally become the evil empire. I used to absolutely despise Apple. Like, seriously, I used to absolutely despise Apple because of the walled garden, because of the way they're doing their stuff. But right now, I am a bigger Apple fan than I am the Microsoft fan. Microsoft has actually been able to out-evil freaking Apple. <laughs> And that's just astounding. And the only one of these big tech players, in my opinion, that's worse than Microsoft is freaking Google. A company that started off with the mantra of don't be evil and then said, hold my beer, watch this. I am going to evolve into an evil monolith that's going to make Microsoft go, holy shit, dude. So yeah, I mean seriously, they want you to pay for something, but it's just constantly more memory intensive. It is it is damn near spyware. You can't turn off your ability to update your own computer in Windows 10 unless you have certain pro versions and you're willing to get into the admin tools. Now, they say that they're doing that for security. What they're really doing that for, make no mistake, it's control. All right? You don't get to decide what goes on with your hardware. You don't get to make the decisions. They get to make the decisions. They get to decide what's on your system, what they take, what they leave, and how much functionality you get to have. And you will pay them every month. For that opportunity to use something that you own or, and excuse my language and gesture here, fuck you. That is their business model. It is a technological equivalent of a cult. And the thing is, they're in trouble. And thank the gods for it. Now their market share is stable. More people are on Windows 10. They've got the subscribers. But Ubuntu and Linux in general is growing more than almost any other operating system out there. And Apple is right up there with them. Because people are tired of not having control. Ubuntu especially is more user friendly. It works on more devices out of the box than ever before. And things like the Steam Proton project, uh, which is allowing Windows games to be played effortlessly on Linux. It's real, folks is actually starting to present reasonable alternatives to the Redman Demon. And they should be quaking in their freaking boots. Because the, as Princess Leia said in A New Hope, the tighter they grip down their hands, the more end users will slip through their fingers. <clears throat> you know, I honestly believe that when the history of this world is written for this era, entities like Microsoft, Apple, and Google will be the East India tea companies of their time. Megalithic monopolies that were so powerful that governments dare not challenge them and only sanction them and even if they did challenge them only through token measures that wielded unfathomable power and perpetuated multiple crimes against 
the people of the world and got away with it because of that power. But they are remembered as devils and villains, and rightfully so. <clears throat> you know, give Ubuntu a try. Uh, April 23rd, they are coming out with uh, version 20.04 the 20th anniversary of Ubuntu Linux very exciting 20th anniversary in terms of additions I'm not sure about how long they've been around the canonical project is how it started and is still like the parent organization um, I will be primarily running Linux on my new build and like I said I've actually got a cassette that holds a hard drive that literally slots in and slots out and that has Windows 10 on it so I'm actually treating Windows 10 like a Nintendo video game cartridge from back in the day when I have to use it I can shut down my computer slide in that cassette drive and restart and it'll boot into Windows 10 and then when I get done I shut it down pull out that drive and it goes right back into Linux you know Nega I was right where you were when I was in my 20s now I I had grown up around technology I was fairly comfortable with technology I I used technology well I didn't know a dang thing about lingu uh, Linux language language what the heck is language Linux and um, I started to learn I I had it dual booted on a laptop it was Mandrake Linux which doesn't really exist anymore and uh, and that was my first experience with it and I just bounced back and forth I've read books it's tough but you can learn it you really can it's very humbling because you know when you grow up like you know I, I was very familiar with Windows uh, and, and so going to a, something where you're not familiar where you can't just sit down on a computer immediately and do what you want to do that's quite humbling I don't recommend anyone just go cold turkey but if you got an old laptop kicking around if you're willing to dual boot or anything like that give it a try might work out for you it's more user friendly than ever um, yeah it's amazing what's happened in 10 years and it's even more amazing what's happened in 20 um, you don't really you don't really uh, use terminal much for anything anymore which is pretty wild I mean you can I do because I'm old school but it's pretty great so 1234 three epic rants and one epic novel to still read hey how you like that for a segue and Finley that is freaking heartbreaking I've had data crashes before I there's a reason why I pay Dropbox every month <laughs> That's another good point. Listen to my IT department. They are like the greatest at this kind of stuff. All right, guys. Are you having fun out there? Did you miss me? <laughs> I wonder how many people we actually have here. Ah, six concurrent viewers right now. Holy crap. Six people listening to me scream about things I cannot control. That's entertainment. <laughs> but anyway, I guess, yeah, wow, tomorrow uh, will be the inaugural stream, the not test stream, of Hair Raising Games, which will be me streaming every other week like we're going to be doing with readings with Rebecca here uh, on Sundays um, and we're going to start with Ori and the Blind Forest not the will 
of the wisp. <laughs> yes, hair yells at cloud. More at 11. <laughs> um, but yeah, we'll start with Ori and the Blind Forest. I haven't played it in a couple years. Uh, we can all laugh at my uh, dubious platform skills. And that's tomorrow at noon. Please be sure to tune in. It's available for everyone, so please share it around with your friend, uh, friends if you want to share the tragedy <laughs> of my gaming <laughs> and my ranting <laughs> and all the other reasons why you guys keep tuning in. Um, so yeah, tomorrow will be my last stream with this old box that I built back in 2011. Now, I had to replace a few components and like the motherboard after a lightning strike in 2014? 2013. Yeah. But, by and large, nine years old. When I miss her. She's been a really solid computer for me. It's passing on to my IT department. Alright guys, I hate to do this, but I am going to pause the stream for just a moment, and then we will get right back to it. We'll get right into the reading of Exile's Return. Alright, don't go anywhere. She's back! Alright guys. Oh my goodness. So I'm trying something new. I got a vertical banner here this week. Um, trying to make it a little bit more legible, the text on the screen. Let me know if you can see it alright. 
Seriously, guys, thanks for being here. Thanks for showing up. Thanks for listening to me rant endlessly about things. I know uh, it, it's, I've been told it's entertaining, but it it's nice to be listened to. It's very gratifying. And, uh... So, we've established everything. Um... I said snow is markedly, markably uh, different between uh, Dawnbreak and Exile's Return, and some of that is just a result of the fact that they were rent, written about five years apart, <laughs> four years apart, almost. But uh, and, and you know, Quantum Leagues covered. That's not even the right term. Uh, massive distances covered in terms of growth as an author, or what I'd like to think is growth as an author. But um, the other side of that is also that Snow is not exactly the same person that wakes up on Sintiok. After years of being lost to feralism, um, she's got to learn how to be in society. She's got to learn how to exist in the human world and right now she's largely along for the ride and I can't imagine how terrifying this might be for her you know by the time we get to Rise of the Forgotten she's been back for almost 10 years and it's largely the snow that we've all come to know and love but right out of Sintiok, right out of Feralism, she's got to grow back into herself. And that's one of the things I actually consider one of my bigger achievements uh, with these three novels. It's how we actually see the progression of her personality, both, you know, into snow, then regressive, then progressive forward and then you know the events that happen and rise well we'll get to that in a couple months because readings with Rebecca is not going anywhere um, I'm going to keep going going to keep reading through my catalog uh, one of the reasons why I'm flipping it out uh, uh, every other week yeah Nega, uh, Nega she just made a great point uh, in a way, uh, this is sort of her becoming her new self, not just from Feralism, and Bottles from her shift. Yeah. Um, she came out of the tank. She had, what was it, two months? Maybe three? And then she was on a ship in complete isolation and remained in that set of isolations for like six or seven years. Something like that. And so she never really got much of a chance, did she? But this is her journey back to the community and to the world at large. So without further ado, if there are no questions or comments, observations, remember please hold all death threats until the end of the live stream. Let's get into it, shall we? Exile's Return by Rebecca Mickley Chapter 3 The ship was confining. Despite its size, the walls curved around, and it smelled so artificial it immediately made me feel slightly sick and long for home. It was sterile and generic, gray steel and wires, the benefits of Lois Bitter design. I took a deep breath, and I was assaulted by the smell of dry, sterile air, with just a hint of metal. I wanted to gag. It made me waver some on the ramp off the shuttle, enough for Charlie to take notice. Everything okay there, Snow? he asked, showing genuine concern. Yeah, just a bit of new ship sickness, I think. You have to understand, it's been years since I've been in an artificial environment. It's a bit disconcerting. And no, I don't need a doctor. Just give me some time to get used to this metal monstrosity, I said, trying to hold down my lunch. Okay. Okay, let's get you to your quarters, he said, as he walked out of the room. 
I hopped after him, having no sense of direction on this technological terror. I tried to keep up, sipping by crew members who seemed greatly surprised to see me skittering about with my toe claws scratching across diligently cleaned floors as my paws instinctively sought traction in the unforgiving still that would never come. I tried to call after Charlie, but all he did was goad me into keeping up. I silently cursed him and each of his progeny for generations to come by the time we came to a nondescript steel door. He tapped a button on the console, and the door slid open to reveal my new quarters. For a military ship, it was large and comfortable, with a large window at one end looking out onto space. The furniture was sparse and screamed government in its design and blandness, but it looked nice enough. Charlie waited as I hopped in and took stock. They had dismantled the bed, leaving it on the floor, allowing me easier access. Next to it was a small desk with a computer terminal set up, and a new identity chip. The quarters were an amalgamation of regulation and quickly made adaption to allow me some comfort and functionality. Who had ever done the work was thinking, as even the faucets had been adapted to someone with my height and situation in mind. As I snipped about and got acclimated, Charlie came in and took a seat in one of the chairs near the windows. This is pretty fancy, Charlie. Much larger than anything I had when I was in the service, I said. Well, you are classed as an ambassador. Rank has its privileges and all, Charlie replied. It appears so. To be honest, I'm more impressed by the modifications. It's not perfect, but it is functional. Well, you have the rest of the evening to get settled in, but before I leave you to get company, I want to familiarize you with some of your new equipment and ship systems, he said, as he pulled out a tiny device and handed it to me. What's this? I asked, as I took it and examined it. Your basic door opener. This way you don't have to reach for consoles. Your identity chip on the table has your updated clearance and will authenticate you to any computer systems you use. As for food, we took on some special supplies for your dietary needs. They are just in that closet over there. Timothy Hay, Alfalfa, even Kimple, if that's your thing, as well as your standard fruits and stuff. Congratulations, you're the only person on this whole ship to have their own refrigerator. Just use the terminal if you need anything, okay? I took the small wrist device and held it to my left forepaw. The nanocord responded and sealed around my foreleg. Then I took the identity chip and clipped it to my collar, removing the old one and setting it aside. Thanks, Charlie. I still don't know what to think about all this, but so far you're keeping your promise. I appreciate that, I said, genuinely. You're welcome, Snow. I'll drop by to escort you to the briefing at 0730. He smiled, rose, and left my quarters. I stretched and took in a deep breath, getting another lungful of dry and sterile air. With Charlie gone, I could really take sock and hopped over onto the bed. I found it comfy enough, but I was restless and nowhere near ready for sleep. I looked around, and my eyes fell on the computer terminal near my bed. I decided if I wasn't going to sleep, I might as well get updated and look for some answers. As I approached the screen, it suddenly sprang to life text flowing across the screen. Accessing, accessing, warning, you are accessing a protected government system. Misuse or unauthorized access is prohibited under law. The warning screen blinked out and the interface popped up. Welcome, Lieutenant. How may I help you today? Popped up across the screen. I didn't know at first what to do and cursed. The keyboard section was your standard touch screen, but the keys weren't lit. The computer's cursor blinked a few times and responded with, Error. Command not found. I blinked, surprised, that it replied to me and tried a basic query. You are voice activated? I asked, testing a theory. Yes, please state your command, came the reply. I thought about what exactly I wanted from this damn thing, and then it came to me. Computer, uh, show me official orders for my reactivation and mission. Confirming clearance. Identity chip code confirmed. DNA sequence verified. Accessing. Accessing. 
A set of official looking orders popped up on the screen. It detailed my reactivation and recall under the Emergency Powers Act as a soldier, and then a set of transfers to the Department of State as a special ambassador for Mendean Affairs. There was a section here that was blacked out with a heading that said Classified Until Briefing 0800, April 29, 2081. I swore under my breath denied any kind of useful information. The anxiety about the job and what they wanted me to do was overriding my anger over being taken from my home. At least the ship had a ghost of familiarity, but this mission was the veritable demon of the unknown. I felt out of my depth and ultimately scared. Effectively locked out of any spoilers or relief, I sat down to catch up on what had been happening with Earth these last seven years. The time had not been kind to Morphix. There were stories of plenty about clinic bombings, rights, challenges, and anti-Morphic groups, just as Charlie had said back on the LRRC. Mankind just couldn't seem to handle the idea that a person with long hairs or fur was still a person. But in a sad and perverse way, it made sense. Humans needed something to hate. They always had, whether it was each other, or aliens, or morphics, the history of the human race was a litany of hatred and rage. Now, though, they had something to really unite against. For the first time, there was another race in the universe, and there were plenty of specious, vitrolic xenophobes who were capitalizing on the knowledge that mankind was both no longer alone and being corrupted. I stared out the window at the vast universe and watched the stars in their silent vigil. A chill went through my body and I felt my fur instinctively fluff out. I never really considered myself a misanthrope, but damn was I disappointed in them. They had the benefit of technology and life extension. They had the stars to explore, but what was on their minds? What was the burning issue of their generation? Whether or not I was still a person? and cursed them for their short-sightedness. I wondered darkly how those protesters back on Earth would feel about a morphic representing humanity to the most powerful known race in the universe. I stared out at space and realized I had power now. Terrifying power. The Mendeans were the most powerful race in the universe, and they wanted to talk to me. I closed my eyes and suddenly felt sick and woozy. It was all just too much for one day. I felt myself grow weak, sick with worry. I fell into my bed and into sleep. And there we go, chapter three. It's real interesting going back through this. And, you know, there, there's all kinds of things, uh, like Snow and her identity chip. We don't see a lot of identity chips, but Snow was a morphic that was shifted outside of the normal processes at the very beginning of morphic existence on Earth. Uh, Snow is technically the 501st morphic to exist. Exactly, 501st. There were 250 that were in Joyce's class. Most were on the Hope. 243, 244 were on the Hope. Six remained just off and around. And then there were 250 that were lizards and birds and the like that had their that were the second wave of the beta program and then there was snow and then while snow was in the tank and going through there were all the other first wave morphics going in and going through as well so snow is pretty much the 500th and first morphic <laughs> and the other thing is UEA systems um, UEA systems on their military ships because they've never included Morphix they're having to bootstrap a lot of these things for access 
so the identity chip helps. It's kind of a transitionary technology between the more advanced DNA scans, what we call GAN scans in the FSU, genetic algorithm number scans, uh, for Morphix now that, that is predominant in the universe. And the bracelets like we saw with Joyce and, and all of that. It was very short lived. But for the purposes of the UEA military, it worked out with snow. I would like to hear very much, nigga. And foreshadowing? Maybe. I, I would like to hear that very much, uh, Miss Nega. Please, let's let's get into it. <laughs> the other thing that's neat is, is you know, the snow perceives the Mendians as the most powerful race in the universe, and to her experience, they are. Um, snow doesn't consider herself a misanthrope. She's absolutely a misanthrope. And I think she gets more comfortable in the idea of being a misanthrope as Exile's return kind of progresses. Um, she's, like I said, she's still kind of coalescing into her future personality uh, after not existing with much of a personality beyond hopping and eating grass um, on Sentioc for so long. That's interesting. That's really interesting. Eagle, lion, and lizard bat. <laughs> now that's a coronavirus. Um, <laughs> sorry guys, I couldn't resist. That's that. That's a neat observation. Um, I'd say you're right. You know, um, later on, uh, when we meet Darnak for the first time in the series, he, you know, they talk about how the path of the other is about embracing other uh, perspectives, and each book is about the evolution of a perspective of some of the characters. They grow, they change. Sometimes it's in terms of mentality, sometimes it's in terms of role. Um, when we meet Tosk, you know, the way that she perceives herself in her entire life will change. That's really solid. That's uh, really solid, nigga. I like that a lot. Uh, in Starfall, uh, the novel that I'm currently writing, um, the transgenics are about to make a sudden reappearance. Uh, which is to say, they're going to make an appearance. <laughs> they get mentioned, but never really uh, seen. But they're about to be. They're definitely about to be. And, uh, but anyway, we'll get into all of that. <laughs> so, any comments? Any questions? If not, we'll get right into chapter four. Just keep on going. Let everything kind of catch up. I just heard the mail come. That's kind of cool because there's a new light ring in the mail that will let me illuminate better. More professional writing. Uh, lighting. Writing. Lighting. <laughs> so we're going to do at least two more chapters. And then we'll see where we're at. Alright. Chapter 4. Alone in my forest. Grazing happily, suddenly a scent, a dangerous scent, caught my nose. The crack of a twig alerted my ears, and I scanned the horizon for danger. Suddenly, out of nowhere, 
A pack of wolves just materialized around me. They dropped low, held still to the last moment, then ran. Four paws tearing savagely at the ground as my hind paws thrust me forward, zigzagging, the wolves nipping at my heels, suddenly too late. Damn! Felt a crunch. My world went red, and I heard an external scream. I jumped awake with a start and shot blindly across the room, slipping and sliding all the way, skidding into the wall, smacking my muzzle, but finally came to a rest under the unused desk area across my room. I worked myself into a corner, panting. Just a dream. Just a damn nightmare, I told myself, struggling for control, my heart beating so fast. Coming back to calm, my mind finally deciphered the ear-splitting noise that was surrounding me, goading me towards panic. It was a wake-up alarm. Computer, shut that damn thing off! I screamed, and suddenly it was quiet in my room again. I looked at my... communicator? The clock read 0645. Someone must have set that damn alarm for me. Counted the time and realized I'd been out for 12 hours. In control again, I set my forepaws forward, arched up my hind end, wiggled my tail, and stretched, welcoming the day. I thought about my home and my life there as I rubbed my sore muzzle. I thought about the state I was in. There was a foggy, disjointed memory of a faraway freedom, a freedom that came only through the rejection of my reason, of everything that I was. Even now, though, I could hear the siren's call. It was so easy to let go, to just let my instincts take over. If I slept again, let myself drift away, there was nothing they could do to hurt me, no threat they could make, no punishment bestowed that would have any meaning. At what price identity? At what price self? Was that terrible freedom worth sacrificing the person I am? I shook my head and realized the answer was no. Even a home like Cynthiac and a peaceful life wasn't worth my identity. I swallowed hard, shaking myself out of my metaphysical quandaries and focused on getting ready for the day. Later. I could deal with this later. After the briefing, a trip to the med bay might just be in order. Getting ready was an adventure. The bathroom was also temporarily modified. It wasn't anything high-tech, but a chain cleverly wrapped around the hot and cold hung down where I could grasp it. Pulling it down in one way turned the water on, and pulling it the other way turned it off. There were even some special soaps for Morphix laid out. I scrubbed myself the best I could, using the brushes and stationary scrubbers to rub up against, which were also a later but thoughtful addition, and was able to get a good solid clean. Dripping wet, I stepped out of the shower, resolved to shake myself dry, but then I saw it. A clear plastic box with a hose supplying air to multiple vents. On the side, it read Fur Dryer 2000. I smirked and hopped in, determined to try it. They had not had things like this when I had left Earth, and it was a new and special joy. One just simply had to stand there, flip the little switch on the side, and rivulets of warm air worked their way through my cooled, wet fur, warming me and making me feel oh so content. I shook myself out of my reverie, refusing to let myself fall victim to this wonderful machine, but grudgingly turning it off. Everything else was basically routine. I shook my fur a few times and it fell into place. I wiggled my sparkly clean tail, slid on my voice collar, and waited for the lieutenant commander. Having sufficiently primped myself, I sat down to a meal. Timothy hay, some alfalfa, and some spinach leaves with some banana slices. I was just finishing my feast when I heard my door chime. Opening the door was Charlie, dressed in his class A's, looking quite professional. I see you're adapting well, Snow. How did you sleep? Don't ask, I said, then grinned warmly. Can I get you anything? Being an ambassador obviously carries some privileges. No, thank you. We need to get you to the briefing room. It's going to be a busy day for you. I'm glad to see you're all groomed, though. You look a little less like a wild animal now, he quipped. 
Yeah, yeah, clever. Now lead the way and don't run me this time, I returned merrily. Aye, aye, certainly are quite demanding this morning, but yeah, let's be on our way, he said, walking beside me as I hopped. I was starting to like him, even though he had given me the orders. He wasn't responsible for them, just a messenger, as trapped as I was in a way. Initially, I'd hated him, but that wasn't rational, and I was still a rational creature. I was sure his career in diplomacy and command had not prepared him to be a glorified babysitter for a fussing morphic. He had been kind, understanding, and receptive when he didn't have to be. My mind quietly catalogued Charlie as one of the good ones as I hopped my way down the corridor to my briefing. Chapter Solid. I like you. I like where you're going with that, Nega. That's that's good development. So here we are. Snow is starting to like Charlie, even though Charlie held her at gunpoint. That's always interested me. But I think she relates to Charlie in a way that she doesn't realize. Charlie spoke about how he didn't have a choice. He couldn't come back without her. He had to find some way to get her to cooperate because the people on the ship that were in command and back on Earth were not going to take no for an answer. And doesn't that sound familiar? The one thing that had driven her to Sintiok was the fact that someone had put a gun to her head and forced her to do something that she would never really forgive herself for. And here's Charlie. And I think they would have had a very different relationship if she had not seen, even though Charlie did try to hide it, his guilt and his good nature. And I think this is also, I think it was also um, why she ends up opening up to him about the hope when he's only the second person she ever really opened up to about it. She didn't even talk to Andropov about it before her shift. They had the shot of vodka. They toasted the little vidra, which is Russian for otter. But the only person she ever told was Paula, and that was out of a sense of guilt. But she starts to like and then talks to Charlie, I think out of a sense of connection, and not just because she likes them, but once again because she recognizes the situation that he's in. So yeah, next chapter, unless there's any questions. <laughs> yeah, remember what I said about killing your darling, Snega Mewtwo? I've been there. Um, the initial, uh, the initial thing with Rise of the Forgotten, it was going to be such a wildly different story. There was going to be a lot more on Earth. There was going to be like rebellions and space battles and resistance movements far beyond anything that made it into the version that ultimately got written and released. I got um, 70,000 words of it down. And then throughout, I went all the way down to like 35 or 40, maybe 45,000 words. Like literally about half. Just retconned it, erased it from existence, and started from Snow's Crisis. And uh, moved from there. Uh, radical alteration in the storyline. And again, that was me... With that novel, learning how to write 
uh, letting the story be what it needed to be, not what I wanted it to be. But all right, <clears throat> let's get into chapter five and then we'll see where we're at. Remember, we are going to be doing back-to-backs, so next week we will be doing another readings with Rebecca, and then after that it will be every other week. Um, I just wanted to make sure that uh, we, we sync with everybody's time as much as possible. Chapter 5 I was guided to my chair and took a seat in an ornate briefing room with fine cloth chairs and a wood grain table that was glazed and slick to my touch. Gazing around the room, I noticed it gave an air of an efficient importance. Perfect for a military ship. Just in front of me was a small paper placard that read out in bold letters Ambassador Snow Dawkins, along with an imitation leather binder that had the emblem of the UEA emblazoned atop it, sealed on the side. I fidgeted and tried to get comfortable in my chair as I noticed a clock on the wall displaying 0800 hours. It was time. I heard the main door lock behind me. My ears naturally turned, tracking the sound, and then I saw someone with the rank of Vice Admiral enter through a side door carrying a leather binder similar to my own, and various aides taking seats around the table. The Admiral was old, and his dress uniform had a number of service boards that illustrated a lifetime of service and honor. He was gruff and barked orders to his assistants, but when he looked at me, his gaze softened some. Ah, you must be Ambassador Dawkins. I am Vice Admiral McHenry, and I will be briefing you, he said politely. Yes, Admiral, and good morning to you, sir. With respect, I'd like to get on mission. Can we begin? The faster we got through this farce, the better, I thought. Certainly, certainly. Go ahead and unseal your binder and open it, he motioned to me. I trust we can skip the formalities then? Indeed, I'm ex-military myself, or was until yesterday. I know how this works, and I've already had a lifetime of protocol, and with all due respect, I think I'm about to get a lot more of it, I said, trying to keep things light. Damn, if that's not true, try being an admiral, he responded jovially. Quietly, I cut the seal with my right foreclaw and opened the binder. Inside was a complete set of orders, not redacted, but what surprised me was what was at the top of my papers. It read an artful script, by special commission of UEA command, you are hereby promoted to captain, with all the privileges and responsibilities of the rank. I draw, my jaw dropped a bit as I realized that my reactivation carried with it a promotion two ranks past where I was at discharge. I looked up, shocked, and spoke to the Admiral. Admiral, is what I'm reading correct? If you, th if you flip through it, it's all there, including the executive order granting special permission for you to serve in the fleet. As you know, your type is normally excluded, he replied matter-of-factly. I couldn't help but sneer a bit. I'm sure it will be a privilege, sir. He noticed my tone. I know you must have reservations about serving, and I can't say as I blame you. I want you to look at the big hit picture here, though. If your mission goes well, it may open up a way for the general order to be rescinded. Your mission, as much as you might not like it, may open a path to equality for morphics everywhere. You know I can't comment on a political matter officially, but your appointment here could change things, he said, genuinely. Sir, with all due respect, I left Earth and her problems long ago. I know I am here, and I have to make the best of it. What I don't understand is why I was reactivated. I know the Mindians asked for me, but why? Captain. The Admiral continued, using my new rank. At 2158 hours, two months ago, we received a special message from the Mendean Council. The message stated that they were requesting a special ambassador, namely you, to represent Earth in the matter of jump gate access and to further technology acquisition. You are to be given special access to their fleet. We are currently en route to rendezvous with them in two standard weeks after we make our jump at gate Nova 16. Admiral, 
what gets me is, why is the UEA honoring this request? I'm sure that special requests and such go out all the time, but what can be gained by this? I hardly have any diplomatic training. Sure, I was part of the first contact team, but I was an astrogation officer, specializing in stellar navigation and math. Didn't handle any treaties, and this is feeling painfully out of my depth. Captain, for the first time in eight years, the Mendians are asking for something for us first. We aren't completely sure why, but they are asking for you. As you know, they are still largely a mystery to us, but we know that they are very, very powerful. Your mission, if it is a success, could smooth things back on Earth. I know you said it doesn't matter to you. Much, but this could save lives, Captain. Anything that we can learn about them could ease some of the tension in the fleet and avoid straining our ties further. I listened intently, trying to take it in, then swallowed and stifled the urge to run, feeling suddenly very trapped. Things were apparently bad enough that the UEA was pinning their hopes and dreams on a prodigal snowshoe hare, and it terrified me. My right forepaw visibly shook as I took a deep breath and tried to steady myself. I looked up, feeling a bit desperate, but needing to know more. Admiral, is there anything else I should know? This is feeling pretty overwhelming at this point. Well, I can say this, that we've explored a fair bit of our galaxy since you left, and in all of our travels we haven't seen anything but the Mendigans. We can't help but wonder why. We have found literally hundreds of habitable planets, but no sign of civilization. Earth needs to know we aren't being set up for a slaughter. We need to know what's going on, and we think you might be able to answer that question. He looked tired and weary, no doubt the years of command weighing on him. I steeled my resolve, took an unsteady gulp of air, and set my forepaws down on the table. Okay, Admiral? I don't have a choice, I know, but I will help. I don't want to see a war more than the next person, and at the very least, the Alliance has been good for Earth. All this new technology, not to mention the use of jump gates, has taken us years into the future. I don't want to see that all thrown away. I felt like I was going to faint. I wanted to run and hide, but this time there was no escape. I watched him seemingly deflate, as if a great weight had been lifted off of him. I realized then they expected a fight. They expected to have to threaten and cajole. He knew they had me, but my level of cooperation was unknown to this point. He seemed content that I wasn't putting up much of a fuss, which meant I had the leverage I needed. Now that we have my orders out of the way, I'd like to talk about compensation. I said, switching the topic of conversation. Well, Captain, you'll be compensated, of course, he said, obviously puzzled. You're going to get paid for this, just like anyone else would. With all due respect, sir, I've spent the last several years eating grass and sleeping under a desk, so money, even a captain's salary, isn't much use to me. I know you have me. If I refused to go or to follow orders, you would have me up on a host of charges and I get life in prison. That's the stick approach to motivation, and it's gotten me to the meeting, but if you want my act of cooperation, you're going to need to offer a better carrot, I said. What exactly do you want? The Admiral asked, curious more than cautious. I want to be left alone. When this is done, I want some kind of order or decree or something that says I can't be recalled again. I'm happy as a civilian. I'd like to go back to my old life and live in peace or just be left to my own devices. It is a more than reasonable request and I will count that as adequate compensation. Generally, these kinds of matters wouldn't be up for debate, but I see your point, he nodded. I'll see what I can arrange, and I'll have a response for you in 48 hours. Thank you. I await your response. I nodded politely and then stood up. <laughs> and I think you're already getting the hang of diplomacy. He laughed, smiling at me. Not ten minutes into the briefing, and you're already negotiating. Indeed. Thank you, Admiral, I said, as we moved to finish the business at hand. Having the hard part over was a relief. Something about getting an explanation, however terrifying, helped focus me. 
I was to spend the next two weeks receiving a crash course in protocol that would fill up most of my days. The Admiral went over in detail the bureaucratic mechanics of my appointment as a special ambassador. In general, members of the military do not serve in that context. It is a completely different branch of the government, and it took a few executive orders and a special act of the United Earth Council to work it out legally. Something inside of me laughed at that. Such a big fuss going on over me. The last person in the galaxy who wanted to cause any trouble. Regardless of my desires, though, they still had fixed me proper. In the end, they were able to recall me under a military act while my service would be purely diplomatic. The briefing ended with no ceremony. The Admiral offered his hand, and I offered a forepaw. He saw the problem almost immediately, laughed, and shook it anyway. I've heard it said that there are two types of people who make it the higher rank in the military. Optimists and alcoholics. Smelling not even a trace of alcohol in him with my sensitive nose, I concluded he must be one of the former, rather than the latter, and returned to my quarters, escorted by Charlie. Congratulations, Captain, he said happily. Stuff it, Charlie, I said, rubbing my muscle, fighting a coming headache. Still not too happy about your situation, I see. Well, you outrank me now, at least, he said, sounding vaguely concerned. I felt something snap in me, all my diplomacy and goodwill having been used up by the briefing. Something was quickly reaching its limit. I tried to choke it back, but I just didn't want to play nice at the moment. God damn it, what do you want me to say? Yes, they made me a captain. They also took me from my home, slapped me with an assignment I didn't want, and stuck me on this godforsaken ship. Not only that, but I also have to negotiate now with a big scary alien race where failure might mean war. What am I supposed to be happy about? I don't have a use for any of this. I feel like I'm being extorted. Damn it all, it's just not fair. Life isn't fair. But I thought I had escaped all of this. I thought I was done. And now here I am being dragged right back. I slammed a hind paw down in anger while my front right forepaw trembled. Forget sometimes how horrible this must seem for you. Why did you leave in the first place? He responded tenderly, sounding genuinely interested. Why did I leave eight years ago? Lots of reasons. It was a treaty obligation to the Mendeans that the technology they shared be made available to the public before they would allow gate access, but already the reaction to the morphic tech was violent. I knew it wasn't covered much in the press in the early years, but I lived it. I'd struggled for years with a lot of existential questions about humanity and about my worth, but I never felt like one of them, Charlie. I never did. This tech, this opportunity, seemed like a godsend. Do you realize how heavily I'm altered? I asked, quietly reliving my last few days on Earth. No, actually. It didn't make your medical file available to me, and to be honest, I didn't want it. If you wanted me to know, I'm sure you'll tell me, he said, carefully. I'm less human than a chimpanzee, Charlie. My brain has been altered to a legal limit. The only thing that really remains is my ability to reason and my memories, but effectively, I'm more of an uplifted hare than a shifted human. I went so far. I took myself out of the species entirely. It was liberating. It made me feel wonderful, the first few moments after my release, padding through the world on new paws, but soon after that, bombing started, hate groups formed. Everything I had always believed about humanity was being confirmed in front of my eyes, so I sold everything I had and left. My god, it must be really terrible having to come back then. I, I had no idea. You must be scared out of your mind. He sounded genuinely sympathetic. I've never known a morphic before. I suppose we just don't run in the same circles. Do most don't take it as far as you do. Most are back on Earth, or the colonies. Why'd you run all the way to the Outer Rim? Part of me has always felt like a coward, Charlie, but part of me is also proud of who I am. There's no doubt this is the real me. This is who I meant to be, but I just... I don't want to face this. The only thing I can think about is going home. I left Earth because I had to. The pressure, the population, 
I didn't think I could ever find a place there and really get some peace. Looking through the news these last few days, the thing that scares me is I think I was right. Seriously, the more I'm here, the more I just want to go back. And you will, I'm sure of it. You just have to get through this mission, he said. So let's get off this depressing topic. You want to get a bite to eat with me? I'd love to. You know, I think you're the closest thing to a friend I've had in eight years, Charlie. Well, I suppose it must be hard to make friends with plants, he said, deadpan. Stuff it, Charlie. I replied. So, Snow is lying out her ass. I mean, all of these things were happening. She saw the hate groups. Remember, we had the protest with Joyce uh, on her first day out in front of the clinics. But she is completely, completely obfuscating here the circumstances of her leaving. Now remember, Earth just wanted it to go away. They largely classified this thing. They they buried it. But Snow is still worried at this point about what might happen to her. But on top of it all, on top of it all, I think it's guilt. She doesn't want to admit what happened, She even to Charlie. She doesn't want to face it. It's much easier to distance herself when she talks about all of the reasons that were pushing her to leave that weren't having a gun put to her head, being forced to damn the person that she probably loved the most in the world. And so we are about three chapters in. We're about, uh, we've read for about an hour. And I think it's probably going to have to be good for this week. We'll do at least another three next week. We'll see what rants I get into next week. Um, wow, somebody just brought in their new light, my new light ring here. You guys will probably never see this thing on camera. But now you will see this thing on camera. I have no idea what you're doing. But all right. Oh, God. Bright light hurt bunny. Um Oh yeah, and then he offers me a green sparkling water. Um like some kind of consolation prize for being a dick. Um <laughs> Anyway <laughs> Oh my goodness. And Nega, the sweetheart, seriously, I mean, you're one of my biggest supporters. Everybody that kind of makes it to these streams every week, you guys are my core fan base. You're, I consider you all friends. I want you guys to have every opportunity to get here so we can hang out. I, I'm not just doing this for entertainment. I mean, part of it is to be entertaining and to have fun and to, and, and to do these things, but it's also so that we can connect. You know, I mean, it means so much to me that you folks find so much meaning in my work. And that you show that through, you know, sharing your hard-earned dollars. Finley works a terrible job that she hates. And yet she still supports me. You know, uh, and, and my work. 
Nega, you're just getting started in the world. I know what it's like to be a 22-year-old living with your parents and stuff like that. You know, you're just getting started. Yet, there you are. You show up for me every month. And you show up to almost every stream. Damon, um, you know, I mean, these things matter. It's important. It makes a difference in my life. And it's humbling and it's an honor. So, long story short, not to get too sentimental on you guys. If, uh... If you guys need me to tweak a time or or whatever to make sure that you can be here, I'm more than willing to do it. Um, because you're the ones that have been here uh, with me from the beginning. You know? So thank you all for being my patrons, for, for being my support, for reading. For giving my work a chance I, I, I dearly want to become successful uh, as an author I think I can be successful as an author I uh, feels very cocky and prideful to say so but I think my work is at least good enough to be successful as an author but that's not going to happen if I don't have my readers and you're the ones that believed in me first that matters to me and I am sorry for the, your struggles, Nega. That is really awful. But all right. If we have any more, no more questions, comments, concerns, now it's time for death threats. This has been Readings with Rebecca. Please be sure if you have the time and ability to join me tomorrow for hair raising games uh, we will be playing some more in the blind forest I'll be drinking some sparkling water and we can all laugh at how bad I suck at these things <laughs> I, uh, I I'm really glad that I'm better at writing than I am at gaming <laughs> I'm kind of embarrassed <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. Finley, you are the raddest. Uh, that is noon tomorrow at twitch.tv slash trailhair. And we'll see you then. And until then, onward towards the farthest star. We'll see you out there.